my name is Jay and welcome to the channel. I hope you're all doing really well. Today we're celebrating hitting 111 subscribers, which is huge for me. I'm super happy about that. You can probably tell by my voice, I'm really excited. And um, I spoke a little bit about it in my last video where we were at 99 subscribers and I was like, okay, I'm gonna upload this video. And by the time I'm ready to put out the, the current video that I'm doing now, uh, I will have reached 100. But turns out I somehow got 11 subscribers from, you know, from that time until now. So 111 subscribers it is. Thank you so much. It, it really means a lot that um, you all like my videos and that you've all subscribed. And today, what we're going to be doing is working on some builds that I've been really excited to do ever since we started Boomy Reptile Sanctuary and in fact, basically ever since we started the channel. What we're going to be doing is working on our desert reptile house and our pangolin conservation center. So it's kind of a two-parter squeezed into one. The arid house is uh, something I've been wanting to build. It's where all our desert reptiles, the small ones, are going to be based. And it's based kind of off greenhouses that I've seen in the Kew Gardens in London and the Botanical Gardens in Copenhagen. So there are lots of these specific desert houses for plants, so like cacti and things like that. And they all have a very similar look, which I thought was really cool, is that they're quite long, rectangular buildings made out of these, um, well, made out entirely of glass, but with these really nice white supports. So they really match quite closely with the glass house theme from the so the glass house pieces from the classic theme within the game. So I thought, yeah, this is going to work perfectly and it's going to look pretty cool, I think. And by the end, I do think it turns out pretty cool if I, if I do say so myself. And again, to celebrate 111 subscribers, I will be putting out uh, this particular reptile house on the Steam Workshop. So once this video is over, if you like what you see and you want to use it in your own part, head down to the description, click on the link, and you'll be able to download it for your own use. And I also have a little bonus download, which I'll show you later on in the video. And today's video, we're also introducing seven new species. Yeah, if you heard that right, in all my previous videos, I've only ever introduced one or two new species. Today, we're introducing seven. So six of them are going to be exhibit species. That's uh, five reptiles and one invertebrate, actually, for the arid desert house. I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet. I think I will call it the arid reptile house, so that sounds pretty decent. And of course, the seventh is going to be our pangolin, which is a habitat species. So not three boxed in a tank, you know, <laughs> just like all the other animals we've done so far. Now we're just going to go through the video. I'm going to talk about what the animals are like, um, kind of some of my building processes. And as we go towards the end, we'll talk about the pangolin house because I will start with the reptile house. And yeah, it's going to be a fun video. We'll just kind of keep things pretty chill. Just chat about a few things with the channel as we go along as well. And uh, as always, feel free to comment any questions you have along the way, any um, feedback you have if you enjoy anything. So yeah, let's kind of, let's get into it. So first off, we have the arid reptile house. As you can see, I'm actually building it over one of our rivers, which I thought was a pretty cool um, design choice. So. It doesn't actually block the river. If you go underneath the water, there's actually metal grate so that the water can still flow underneath it, which I thought was a pretty cool uh, design choice. It's also partially open. It's not like a pure greenhouse where, you know, you go in and it's completely climate controlled and you have to open doors. This is more partially open. So that I would imagine the climate is controlled to an extent. Uh, for example, like water, obviously if it rains, these plants aren't going to get rained, so, rained on, so they can be watered more precisely because all of them are desert plants and of course I did really want to use a lot of desert plants because they're really good they're all the models and design for the desert plant to cacti so so nice but I haven't had a chance to use them because of course we haven't really had any desert animals so I made it like this and I made one level kind of partially lower than the other and that level the lower level is open out to and it faces the river so that later on I think that's where I'm going to put the Gauriel. So that will kind of act as well as being the reptile house. It's also going to be a viewing platform for our Gauriel. So I think I think that's going to be a pretty cool thing once you have people coming in. And of course, um, it's a very long building, very rectangular. But at the end, I decide to 
kind of change things up a bit and break off the building into a few separate weird angles. So I think that turned out really cool. So you'll see that as we go on now. I'm super happy with that. Obviously, it took a lot of a uh, finagling. I had to like move the glass pieces into place in very different ways and sometimes I had to overlap them. But by the end, I thought it turned out really excellent. I was so, so happy with it. And um, it looked really great with all the plants, with the reptiles in there. And once people start walking through, I thought it looked really cool. And yeah, so let's talk about the animals we have in here. We have a total of six species within the area reptile house, like I mentioned. Um, so four of them are actually snakes. We have one lizard and we have one scorpion. So uh, just uh, a little bit of a warning. I know a lot of people don't like snakes or they're afraid of snakes. So you will see some close-ups of snakes here. Uh, as I talk about them, I will show some pictures just to kind of demonstrate what they look like because these animals are quite small. So I'm just going to take some real life pictures to kind of show you what they look like before the cinematics. So yeah, just a bit of a warning there. If you're, if you're not a fan of snakes or lizards or scorpions, maybe this video is not entirely for you, but I'm going to bet that if you're watching something called Boomy Reptile Sanctuary, you knew this was coming and you love these animals just as much as I do. So yeah, <laughs> that was my uh, little bit of a warning. But personally for me, I love snakes. I love lizards. I am actually planning on getting a pet snake within the next couple of years. Uh, in fact, a few different pet reptiles. I want to get into the reptile hobby. Um, I'm planning on getting a ball python personally for my first animal. And then maybe later on a few others like a western hognose or, you know, like a Euromastix lizard would be really cool. And obviously my ultimate goal would be to get a reticulated python, which would be absolutely bonkers and I can't do that right now because you know it's the longest snake in the world I don't want to you know get eaten or anything without <laughs> I, I want to get some expertise first anyways back to the build itself let's talk about the species we have here first off we have the western diamondback rattlesnake rattlesnakes are pretty famous in the world you know everyone's got the image of a snake like shaking its little rattle being like and uh these guys grow to about four feet and the longest ever reported, I believe, was seven feet. Super venomous, very, very highly venomous. And their venom is actually a hemotoxin. So hemotoxins are things that break down your blood. And as we all know, you know, you want to keep your blood in intact. You don't want your blood cells kind of like popping all over the place. That's not good for you. <laughs> Anyways, these guys are found throughout the southern reaches of North America and North Central America, you know, that kind of area where the um, the U.S.-Mexican border is. So throughout Mexico, Texas has load, loads of these animals. And, um, and they're definitely more of an arid climate animal. They're not tropical at all. They live in deserts. And they are not actually endangered. Most of these animals we're going to see today aren't really endangered when it comes to the small reptiles. And you can often find them in zoos. So you do see uh, rattlesnakes in zoos. You do see a lot of the venomous snakes in zoos. And occasionally you will see people who do collect snakes do have venomous snakes, but those are very rare. And again, they're mainly only experts that have them, people who uh, want to get venom so they can make anti-venom, stuff like that. Next up, we have the puff adder. Now this guy is a chunky boy. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really fat looking snakes. I don't want to like fat shame the snake. I mean, <laughs> he's a snake, but basically they're really wide for snakes and they have a really small tail. Now, if you're not familiar with snakes, you might be wondering like, Jay, uh, aren't snakes basically just a head with a tail? And to that I say, no, they're, they're really not. They've got a head, they've got a very long body and at the end, it actually comes in a little bit and that's where the tail is. And when it comes to these puff adders, they've got a big head and they've got a really thick body, like it's quite wide. And then they've got a smaller tail near the back. So you, like, if you have a look at it, you'd be like, oh, this guy doesn't look like it could be like super fast or anything like that. But they do strike very fast and they actually have a very strong venom. It's a cytotoxic venom. So as opposed to the previous venom, which destroys blood cells, this destroys any cell that it comes into contact with, which is really not good. <laughs> So in the wild, they are found throughout Central and Southern Africa. And one really interesting thing is that puff adders actually do really well in captivity. In fact, they do a bit too well for their own good because they really love eating. And in the wild, that's good because they eat whatever they come across. But when they're being fed regularly, they'll eat every single time. And um, 
if you know snakes, snakes actually don't need that much food. A lot of snakes eat once a week, maybe even less. And puff adders, they, they eat really well. So <laughs> they just strike whatever they get and they get a bit too chunky for their own good in captivity. But of course, these are quite simple fixes that uh, zookeepers can just provide slightly less food or regulate the food a bit better and they do quite well in captivity. Next up, we have our first lizard, which is the Gila monster. Now, for an animal named a monster, this guy is pretty, pretty adorable, I do have to say. Super cute. Lovely coloration is these dark, dark, like deep black with these really bright splotches of orange and red. Beautiful animal. Really love it. Uh, it's one of the only venomous snakes in the world. Uh, sorry, so they're one of the only venomous lizards in the world. It's not a snake, it's a lizard. Uh, I just got my words mixed up there. And uh, it's, they're super fascinating. They get about two feet long. They're, um, here's the thing. Just because they're venomous doesn't make them a threat. They don't move very much. They're pretty sluggish animals. And they're a threat to their prey items, but they're not really a threat to, you know, people. You can pretty much outwalk these guys. <laughs> they, they really don't move very fast. But they're super lovely animals. Um, they do okay in the wild, but they are near threatened. They do have suffer some issues from habitat loss. But um, yeah, otherwise they're okay. They do live uh, throughout North America. And in zoos, one interesting thing is that they do successfully breed quite well, as discovered in San Diego Zoo, which bred the first pair in captivity. That's pretty cool. The next two snakes that we're going to have in our park are probably the most venomous animals we're going to get in here. Like, period. They are probably, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, they are in fact the most venomous animals in our park. And no surprise, they are both from Australia. <laughs> I believe, I'm not 100% sure about the statistic, but I think something like, out of the top 10 most venomous snakes in the world, there's only one or two which are not in Australia, which is kind of insane. So... Let's talk about the first one, the Eastern Brown Snake. Like its name, it is in fact a brown snake from the east of Australia, though it is more native to Central Australia, so not entirely Eastern, but you know. <laughs> they get to about seven feet long, which is pretty, pretty hefty for a snake, and they're not threatened in the wild, so to speak. They're pretty solitary animals. They're usually found in open habitats, eucalyptus forests, um, quite a lot of different varied areas, and the, the difficult bit being they're also really common in the outskirts of human development, so cities and towns. And as the second most venomous snake in the world, yeah, that's not the best. I believe it does make up something like 60% of all um, snake bite fatalities in Australia, which again, it's not the snake's fault, you know, like don't, I don't like the whole concept of demonizing animals for human fatalities. Their venom is actually quite interesting. It's a blood clotting venom. So what happens is it creates these blood clots and that can lead to thrombosis. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's when you have a blood clot and it flows up your blood vessels and ends up in all sorts of uncomfortable places, which is really, really not good for your health. <laughs> and our next and final snake actually is the death adder. It's our second adder and like the puff adder, it is a chunky boy. They're also very thick around and not super long. And these guys are found even more easternly than the eastern brown snakes of Australia. And uh, while they're still considered unthreatened, these guys are actually beginning to suffer at the hands or um, should I say the mouth of the invasive cane toad species. Now these guys are these big toads that have been introduced to Australia ages ago and they've been wreaking havoc on ecosystems. In the, uh, invasive species are tough to handle because they outcompete a lot of native species and then they prey on animals which previously didn't have predators like this. So these death adders are being eaten by these huge toads, which um, weren't even in this environment not that too not too long ago. So yeah, invasive species, not, not the best. Also um, back to the adder itself. So death adders have a neurotoxic venom. So that paralyzes the nervous system and that is Again, not good for your health, because if you can't use your nerves, you can't do things like move or breathe or, you know, any of the important stuff for life. <laughs> so one more interesting thing about the death adder, actually, which is quite unlike a lot of snakes. Um, some snakes do, of course, but this one in particular bears live young, so it doesn't lay eggs. It just gives birth. 
So that's pretty cool, I think. Some of the snakes do that, boa constrictive, uh, come to mind, they, they give birth live young. So a few other snakes do in fact do that, but this is just one of the more interesting things. Moving on from our reptile house, which is looking pretty solid now, let's talk about the Pangolin Conservation Center. So what I've done is I've kind of just dug out a semi, semi sunken habitat which is also going to be semi-enclosed. So the sunken area is going to be within the conservation center itself and the pangolins also have an outdoor space. When it comes to habitat itself, I primarily built it out of rocks. And um, the, uh, sorry, the pangolin conservation center itself is built, it's a pretty standard building, I think. There's not anything too interesting about it. So you can see on the screen, it's a pretty regular building. Uh, the interesting part about this, I think, comes with the pangolin habitat itself, because within the conservation center in the sunken area, I built a sort of um, pangolin viewing cave. So it's a cave for the pangolins, which has these holes in it that you can kind of look into. I've seen a lot of these kind of um, structures in zoos and I thought, oh, this is a cool idea. Let's let's give that a shot. So I made it kind of like, it looks almost like an igloo made of rock, um, but it has all these holes at different eye levels. So adults can look in, kids can look in, and you can see pangolins doing their own thing, gives the pangolins a bit of privacy because they're very shy animals. And uh, I think it looks really cool. This is actually that bonus download I mentioned at the start. You will be able to download this pangolin shelter. It works for any real small animal. Um, the macaques can use it. The red pandas can use it. Uh, just, you know, it's uh, made out of the temperate rock. So of course it doesn't fit all biomes, but if you want to make your own version, feel free to just follow along with the steps I'm doing here. It is pretty straightforward. You just have to align the uh, flat cladding rocks in a specific direction, rotate them until you get a nice shape, and then individually rotate those to give it some variation and make it look cool. So that's kind of it. Uh, I really like it. I think it turned out super excellent. The conservation center itself, minus the habitat, not too interesting, I think. Pretty standard building. I, I was going to try and make a few custom like book stands and stuff like that, but... I'll save that, I think, for my next part, because right now with Abumi, I'm kind of just working my way towards the end so that I can get it out there. Of course, I'm not rushing it, but I do feel like I want to preserve a certain sense of style. For example, I didn't go super detailed at the start, so I don't really want to go super detailed now. So sticking to the kind of that same level throughout the park to maintain that consistency. So hopefully that works out. Anyways, let's talk about the animals themselves. Pangolins are the best. They're such cool animals. I, I love pangolins to bits. They're just so cool. Like, look at them. They're so adorable. I mean, you can't see any right now because they're not on screen, <laughs> but you'll see them in the cinematics. They're just the coolest, lovely little animals. Unfortunately, they are critically endangered. Um, they're, in fact, the most trafficked animal in the world, which is ah, it's just such a shame. And it's so mind-boggling because they're being poached for entirely pointless reasons. Traditional medicine, for example, like these guys don't have medicinal properties. They're just little dudes with scales trying to hang out, you know? <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's the thing though. They are actually the, they are the only mammal species with actual scales. And uh, when you think of pangolins, you may think of just the one type. There's actually loads of pangolin species, both across Asia and Africa. And the African pangolin species actually look really cool. They have these really deep brown scales with a yellow kind of edging to them. Looks really cool, so definitely Google those if you have the time. Check out all the different pangolin species. I do have pangolins local to my country, um, where I'm based right now, which is Malaysia. Those are the Sunda pangolin. They're pretty similar to the Chinese pangolins, which we have in the game here. Uh, they're just a bit smaller, I believe. But yeah, the pangolins are just, uh, they're just so lovely. They're very secretive animals. They're very nocturnal, so they spend most of the time moving about at night. They move pretty slowly and they're really not aggressive. They're they're just such chill animals. I mean, they're, they're aggressive if you're an ant, basically. They eat ants, termites, that sort of things. And um, when they feel threatened by anything, they curl up into a ball, which is so cute. And um, it works really well. For example, if you have like a clouded leopard or something that's trying to attack it, all they have to do is curl up in the ball and their scales are super tough. So the leopard can like paw at it and nothing will happen. 
but unfortunately it makes it really easy to be captured by people. So when poachers come up to it, they get scared, they curl up in a ball, and all the hot poachers have to do is pick them up, which is, ah, uh, I'm just like, ugh, pangolins, why? <laughs> you know, it's just like, you were doing so good. <laughs> and your one, your one defense being used against you is such a shame. Oh, I really wish, you know, like, pangolins, uh, they just, they're one of my favorites. And because of that, I feel so strongly for them, especially when it comes to these situations. They just, you know, there's such an innocence to animals like this. There's no, like, to all animals, of course, but just with an animal like this, it just exudes the sense of purity and innocence that, you know, you always think of when you look at the world as a whole. They're just these little dudes trying to go about their lives, you know. And uh, and something about that defense mechanism, too, that really resonates, you know, just to curl up in a ball. It's just, uh, I don't even know how to express it, but yeah, they're just lovely, lovely, but tragic animals and... You know, I really hope very much that they do recover their numbers in the wild. There are a lot of efforts being made to recover the numbers. Um, there are captive breeding programs that are being attempted. They're not super successful at the moment because we don't know the specifics on how they breed and stuff because they're so secretive in the wild. But um, we, we can still, you know, support these causes, support pangolin recovery. Of course, do not buy traditional medicine. Don't buy into that whole trade that sort of thing by you know if you need medicine get something that's scientifically approved you know <laughs> but yeah this is just, just like animals like these they do really need our help and i do think there's hope i think that you know we can always get out there and really help animals like this and it would be such a shame to lose them because they're so lovely and so adorable and they just they just chill in you know everyone would just wants to chill and live their lives I was nearly gonna go full meme and just be like, you know, they do just be vibing. <laughs> Don't, I'm not gonna. <laughs> oh, I just did it, didn't I? I have, I apologize. I've gone full millennial or now yeah, maybe a full Gen Z. Is that, is that what I am now? I don't know. I've just, I've, I've started living the meme, you know, that's just what's happened. God, I must sound so old. <laughs> I promise you, I'm not old. <laughs> I'm like 24. I'm not that old. Am I? I don't know. I'm getting too old. Back to uh, back to pangolins. They're great. <laughs> as much as I've said it, I just want to say it again. They're so cool. And I, I do recommend you guys check out more about pangolins. They're not very well-known animals, so just look into them. They're super cool. Very interesting animals. Uh, look into the African ones as well. I've not seen one in the wild yet. I would love to see one in the wild. I've seen one in captivity when I was a kid, uh, but it was all balled up. So I, all, all I saw was this scaly ball, and I was like, hmm, where's the head? <laughs> But yeah, super cute animals. Really love how this came out. And I do I do hope you guys have actually enjoyed this episode. I hope you've enjoyed learning about all these animals today. I've, I'm going to try and do more of this where I talk a bit about the animals, about what they're like, you know, whether they're threatened in the wild, what's being done to help them, how you can help. Uh, I'm going to do a bit more on that last bit later on, I think, for my future videos where maybe I'll include some links as well to uh, resources where, you know, there are people out there who are helping them and maybe... I'll link to their pages and stuff like that. So um, let me know if you th if you would like stuff like that. I, I might still do it anyways just because I think it's useful to have. And um, even if you don't click on them, some uh, it's still in good to know, I guess. So, well, I'll just probably do that. <laughs> but yeah, um, once again, thank you so, so, so much for 111 subscribers. It means so much to me that I get to do this and really enjoy doing it and that other people enjoy doing it. Uh, watching it and you know playing the game or watching me play the game it, it just means a lot and I am really really thankful yeah so that that is all about it remember to check out the links to the workshop to download the builds that I made today um, if you want to explore Boomy Reptile Sanctuary for yourself I do think we only have about three episodes left to go and then we'll be releasing the whole park out on the workshop the next episode is either going to be the Goriels or our Tropical Reptile House, which is going to ha be something like this, but of course tropical themed with a lot more of the other small exhibit reptiles and invertebrates. So stuff like the iguanas, the anacondas. That's going to be quite a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to that. Between episodes, I'll probably do some gardening. You know, there's a lot of sparse, like, empty areas in Bumi, so I'm going to plant trees and stuff like that. I might do a mini episode, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So, yep. So uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching everyone. Please comment if you have anything you want to let me know, you know, 
feel free to just chat down there. And uh, subscribe if you like this content and you want more. And of course, I will see you all in the next episode. Bye.